The Way of the Spirit, Reflections on Life in God, Archimandrite Emilia Nos of Simenopetra, Preface by Archimandrite Eliseos, Abbot of the Sacred Monastery of Simenopetra Manathos, Translation, Introduction by Father Maximo Simenopetridis, Nicholas Constas. In Dictos Press, Athens, 2009. Preface. This book is an offering to our brothers and sisters throughout the world, for love does not seek its own, but desires communion with others, teaching us to sing in other tongues. We cannot say we have no need of you, for without you our joy will not be complete. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 and 12, verse 21. Elder Emilianos was our guide, teacher, and father in Christ, and remains so to this day. We lived with him for many years traveling together in the way of the Spirit. The discourses collected in this volume give expression to his personal experience of God, which was always real, living, and dynamic. We believe that they will fill you with joyful hope. Even so, we have here only the surface, the crest of a rising wave, continuous with an infinite sea. In the receding tide, we discover traces on the shore, like sounds in an empty shell that once harbored life. There, we look, listen, and wait. To love, in a sense, is to accept and consent to this distance. But these are no ordinary signs, and from here our journey begins, as on the threshold of spiritual change. Read this book in a spirit of peace, with no anxiety about understanding new concepts or learning things under pressure. Let your reading and attention be unforced, a form of prayer. As you hold the shell to your ear, listen for the word of God and enter into communion with him. How sweet is the voice of our beloved. The winter is past, flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come. Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 10 to 12. Signed, Pentecost, 2008, Archimandrite Eliseos, abbot of sacred monastery of Simonopetra, Mount Athos. Introduction. The Way of the Spirit is a collection of 12 spiritual talks by Elder Emilianos, who from 1974 until his retirement in 2000 was the abbot of the sacred monastery of Simonopetra on Mount Athos. While many of these talks were originally addressed to monks and nuns, we believe that they speak without distinction to all who thirst for God. Union with God, not through words and theories, but through experience and illumination, is the goal of our sojourn on earth, and it is precisely this teaching that flows from each page of this book. We shall say more about its contents in a moment. Now it is time to introduce its author. Elder Emilianos was born in Athens in 1934 to refugees from Asia Minor, who had settled in the Greek capital. His childhood and adolescence unfolded against the background of World War II, the German occupation of Greece and the Greek Civil War. During those troubled times, he lived primarily with his paternal grandmother in the relative safety of a refugee village in Halkidiki, just a few miles from Mount Athos. As a young man, the elder was active in the church and distinguished himself as a youth leader and catechetical school instructor. Upon graduating from high school, he entered the Theological School of the University of Athens, where he took a degree in 1959. At the time of his graduation, he was considering ordination to the priesthood, with the intention of becoming a foreign missionary. This was a logical next step for a young theologian who had already demonstrated a gift for the preaching and teaching of the gospel. In order to prepare for such work, he decided to spend a period of time in a monastery and was directed by a friend to the Bishop of Tricala, Dionysios, who was then reviving monastic life in the region of Meteora. The bishop became the elder spiritual father, and it was at his hands that on the 9th December 1960, the elder was tonsured a monk, given the name of Amelia Nos, and enrolled in the Brotherhood of the Monastery of St. Pesarion. Two days later, he was ordained to the diaconate, and on 15th August of the following year, 1961, he was ordained to the priesthood. Although we are not 
in a position to know all the details, it seems clear that the elder did not feel an overwhelming, irresistible call to monastic life, which he viewed simply as a stepping stone to missionary work. He was a bright, energetic young man with a future and was not about to spend the rest of his life in a half-deserted monastery in Thessaly. While he was there, however, he was overtaken by an event of such magnitude that it radically transformed his life, confirmed him permanently in his monastic voc vocation, and left its mark on all his subsequent work. We learn more about this extraordinary moment in the following remarks by the elder's disciple and successor, Archimandrite Eliseos. At the monastery of St. Pisarion, Father Emilianos was granted a revelation of the monastic life, or rather, a profound mystical experience of the light of God, which inundated him at the hour of the liturgy. Henceforth, his every divine liturgy, prepared for by a long vigil, was a sublime experience of God's glory, a mystagogy reminiscent of the decisive revelatory events that sealed the history of the people of Israel. As a result, he resolutely made up his mind to partake of the ascetic tradition rather than to assume ecclesiastical duties in the world. Footnote that excerpt taken from the spiritual tradition of Simonopetra in Mount Athos, the Sacred Bridge, the Spirituality of the Holy Mountain, edited by Dmitri Koromos and Grams Speak, Oxford, 2005. To continue, like the dramatic conversion of St. Paul, the elder emerged from this experience a different man, supremely energized and single-mindedly committed to monastic life. With newfound clarity of purpose, he entered deeply into the mystery of the liturgical life of the Church and devoted himself to prayer, spiritual study, vigils, fasting, and other ascetic labors. Recognizing the remarkable change in the spiritual bearing of his young priest monk, the bishop appointed him abbot of the monastery of the Transfiguration at Meteora. He additionally assigned him to preach at a large parish church in the city of Tricala and exhorted him to teach and hear confessions throughout the surrounding region. He was only 27 years old. By all accounts, the elder was a spellbinding preacher, exploiting to the full an elevated, indeed charismatic, rhetorical style. He poured forth a torrent of discourse. With a brilliant sense of drama and timing, he delivered himself of striking utterances, often rising to the level of poetry and ex exalted religious praise. With his large expressive face and eyes, he established close and immediate relation with his listeners, whom he addressed in a voice of astonishing power and range, capable of extraordinary modulation from a soft, bewitching whisper to a booming Vesuvian roar. The gift of eloquence, of course, was not an end in itself, but was given back to God and placed in the service of the Holy Gospel. The elder soon took the region captive, especially its youth, who flocked to him in great numbers, teaching by word and example both from his monastic enclosure and in the heart of the city, he acquired a rapidly growing number of disciples. Many of them felt called to live the monastic life under his direction, and the first tonsures took place in 1963. Others were to follow. In a relatively short period of time, Meteora had become home to a large dynamic community of young monks, an equal number of women, many of whom were the sisters and cousins of the monks, had also heard the call to monastic life, obliging the elder to convert a nearby abandoned monastery into a convent. Other disciples married and or became priests in the world, but all were part of a larger spiritual family which had its center at Meteora and in the spiritual teaching of its young abbot. Within a few years, however, the increasing pressure of tourism began to disrupt the spiritual life of the new communities. It was either move or else become museum curators and tour guides for the literally hundreds of visitors bust in daily during the high season. In 1970, another blow was struck with the death of Bishop Dionysios, the elder's mentor and staunch monastic patron. 
Flight seemed unavoidable, but to where? The dilemma was solved by a handful of geriatric monks locked in a decaying mountain fortress on the peninsula in the North Aegean. These were, of course, the aged fathers of Simonopetra, who invited the elder and his brotherhood to settle on Athos and bring new life to their dying community. Devastated by a fire in 1891 and under Turkish rule until 1912, Simonopetra fell further into decline beginning in 1931, after the unjust expulsion of its saintly abbot, Jerome, and the departure of some 20 monks who left in protest with him. By the 1950s and the whole of the following decade, the specter of depopulation had spread its melancholy wings over the entire peninsula. Like most of the other monasteries, Simonopetra seemed like a vast ruin from the past, haunted by a small number of monks, all of them advanced in years, with no novices in sight. But things were beginning to change. For the elder and his monks, the invitation was a gift from God, which they gladly accepted. And on 25th November 1973, the elder was elected abbot of Simonopetra. His official enthronement followed on 17th December. In his remarks on that day, he described the event as a new beginning and a new birth. He exalted in the mountains history and holiness, calling it, quote, the upper room of a permanent Pentecost, from which the grace of the Spirit never ceases to shine its brightness in your soul, end of quote. Their journey had come to an end, for he and his exiled monks had found a place of rest for the Lord, a tabernacle to the God of Jacob. Psalm 131.5 But if the journey was over, the work was just beginning, as the monks set about restoring their new home, an ancient ten-story labyrinth perched on a cliff 1,000 feet above the sea. Although they could not have fully known it at the time, <clears throat> the presence on Athos of Elder Emilianos and his brotherhood was a critical factor in the contemporary renewal of monastic life on the peninsula. In the midst of this already crowded moment, the elder was also seeking a place of rest for his community of nuns. Once again, the monks of Manathos provided the solution. An hour's drive from the Athenite border, in the town of Ormelia, the monastery of Vatoperi possessed an old and unused dependency which Simonopetra purchased, restored, and extended. On 5th July 1974, the nuns were establishing in their, established in their new home. The elder consequently became the founder of a large convent for which he also wrote the Constitutional Charter, the definitive version of which was conveyed to the convent in May of 1975. Construction on the new church began in 1980, and a formidable monastic complex soon came into being with over 100 nuns. The convent dedicated to the Annunciation of the Theotokos, but more commonly referred to simply as Ormelia, is a dependency, a metokion, of Simonopetra, and follows a modified Athenite typicon. In October of 1991, it was given patriarchal and stavropagic status by the Patriarchate of Constantinople. Beginning in 1995, Elder Emilia Nos began to suffer from an increasingly debilitating illness that would ultimately force him to step down as the abbot of Simonopetra. In 2000, he was succeeded as abbot by his disciple, Archimandrite Eliseos. The elder currently resides at the convent of the Annunciation in Ormelia. Elder Emilianos was a gifted speaker. He was also an extremely prolific speaker. For whoever drinks from the water of life is changed and becomes one who gives drink pouring himself out in abundance. Systematic tape recording of his many sermons and talks began in 1968 and continued without interruption through the spring of 1994. The total archive contains an astonishing 3,000 recordings. This means that on the average, the elder delivered some type of formal public address 100 days out of the year for 30 years. About 
60% of these were delivered to a monastic audience, and the remaining 40% in parishes in Greece and Cyprus. A very small number were given at theological gatherings or church conferences and symposia. When invited by a bishop to speak in a town or city, the elder would often give two talks on the same day, usually a Sunday, in two different churches. Needless to say, these figures do not take into account the informal talks and other forms of communication, conversations, correspondence, phone calls, which were part of the elders' daily pastoral ministry. In terms of their duration, sermons delivered in parishes, normally in the context of the Divine Liturgy, average about 40 to 45 minutes in length. Addresses, addresses and talks given in parish halls in similar settings range from an hour to an hour and a half. The longest are the discourses delivered to monks and nuns, which range from an hour to, to a half to two hours in length, and often longer. Many of these began before Vespers and continued after Compline. The elder also commented extensively on ancient monastic rules and ascetic writings, generating series of talks unfolding over the course of many days, weeks, and months. <clears throat> Chapter 8 of this book is a segment from one such series. And it is remarkable that when addressing his monks and nuns, the elder never spoke from a prepared text and only rarely used a set of notes. Like an overflowing spring, the elder ceaselessly poured himself out to his disciples, offering his words to them with all the magnificent prodigality of divine love, like the excess wine at Canaan, or the multiplication of the loaves of bread, which is always the sign of God's grace, the boundless self-distribution of the Son of Man for the life of the world. Before bringing this introduction to a close, it will be helpful to say a word about the nature of the texts which appear in this volume. The way we read and respond to a text is in large measure conditioned by what we bring to it, not least by our shared cultural assumptions concerning the kind of work we have in front of us. We do not read a poem in the same way that we read a newspaper. Neither do we read and respond to an instructional manual as we would to a long-awaited letter from a friend. In each case, we approach the text in question and enter into its world of meaning with different presuppositions and expectations, with different levels of energy, attention, and consciousness. What sort of texts, then, do we have here, and how might we best approach them? What will be helpful to bring us with us on our journey, and what is best left it behind? Of the twelve talks collected in this volume, three are sermons or homilies that were originally delivered in parishes before large public audiences, chapters 2, 3, and 10. They focus on the gospel reading of the day or some aspect of the liturgical year, such as the beginning of Great Lent, which provides both structure and a point of departure for related themes and subjects. An equal number, chapters 9, 11, and 12, were delivered in a non-liturgical setting to small groups of lay theologians and teachers of religion. They tend to combine elements of traditional theological teaching with the inspirational character of homily. This will all be relatively familiar territory to anyone who has heard a sermon or listened to a discussion of theological ideas, and as such presents no special problems to the reader. The remaining six talks, however, chapters 1 and 4 through 8, are special forms of discourse addressed to monks and nuns given at special gatherings of the community known as a synaxis. At its most literal level, the word synaxis denotes a gathering or assembly, especially for public worship and teaching. It is traditionally used to designate the Eucharistic liturgy and the gathering of the church in a particular place. A synaxis, then, is the realization and revelation of the body of Christ, a being present with Christ, which necessarily involves the presence of the entire community. And this is precisely why Christ came, quote, to gather into one the children of God who were scattered abroad, John chapter 11, verse 52. And thus he often gathered together with his disciples, John 18, verse 2, telling them that where two or three are gathered, 
In my name there I am in the midst of them. Matthew 18.20 Outside of this reality there is only isolation and fragmentization. For he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. That the elder was plainly aware of the special character of the monastic synaxis is evident in the following passage from chapter 7. Quote, As you know, we do not come together in these assemblies to discuss matters of doctrine or problems in ethics. Neither is it my purpose here to offer you personal counseling or advice. Instead, we are here to participate in an event of communion. Our eyes are all focused on the same thing, a particular point or moment in the life of Christ. And because we are all looking at Christ, we are, are able to behold our imperfections and accomplishments. We see our movement forward or our disengagement and retreat. And thus, our assemblies, our synaxes, are communications with God himself, who sometimes reveals one thing to us and sometimes another. End of quote. As the elder makes clear, the purpose of the synaxis is not to discuss matters of doctrine or problems in ethics. The synaxis is not a theological lecture or an academic seminar. Its values are neither intellectual nor even moral, but existential. Second, the radical corporal, corporate nature of the gathering does not allow for personal counseling or advice designed to satisfy the needs of an isolated individual. The community does not gather in order to learn anything, but rather to enter into and experience the mystery of Christ. Like the Eucharistic synaxis, of which it is an extension, the monastic synaxis is an event of communion, a moment in which the community looks at Christ, is illumined by the vision of God, and in so doing attains heightened self-knowledge as it becomes the bearer of divine revelation. Understood in these terms, the monastic synaxis does not have immediate parallels within our ordinary experience of language and communication. In essence, it is an encounter with Christ in and through the community, concentrated in the charismatic word of the elder, who seeks not to instruct his listeners but to transform them by conforming them to the form of Christ. Romans 8.29 and Philippians 3.21 this is why the elder's word is always a spoken word. He wrote virtually nothing. For true teaching flows from the person. It emerges through the experience of presence and encounter, inseparable from the living word, whose internment in writing necessarily incurs a loss of power and effectiveness. Only the spoken word makes dialogue possible. Only the spoken word makes it possible for an elder to adapt his teaching to the needs of the disciples. The living, existential character of the synaxis cannot be bound by the rigid constraints of dead letters. A sudden tangent will prove to be a central. A gratuitous aside will wend its way to a source of light, which seems secondary or superficial, will be of paramount significance, the deep foundation. The composition will everywhere vibrate with the harmonies and discords of the community, keyed to the spiritual level of its listeners, being exactly what they needed or were able to hear at the time. The monastic discourses of Elder Emilianos are thus the record of a pilgrimage. In the truest sense of that word, to saunter means to visit the sacred places, not in a predetermined, rigidly laid out plan not with a relentlessly pursued aim or goal, but rather as an organic unfolding, a spontaneous movement of love and knowledge, forever exceeding its boundaries, and like all living things, growing beyond its momentary form in fulfillment of its destiny in God. The Way of the Spirit contains a rich harvest of spiritual experience cultivated through prayer and tranquility. It is an invitation to partake of the life-giving bread of wisdom. The spiritual instruction and discourses collected in this volume have the Holy Spirit as their inspiration, vesture, and ground of convergence. As you will soon discover, this book is not a theor 
theoretical treatise on spirituality or mysticism, but rather a message of love directly shaped by the living experience of life in the spirit, the mystical cry of the soul, ever seeking union with God. Note on the translation. The Way of the Spirit is an English translation of 12 tape-recorded homilies and discourses by Elder Emilianos that were first published in Greek in 1998. See below texts and translations. In addition to the Greek printed text, we have made use of the original tape recordings, partly to clarify ambiguities in the printed text and partly to attend to the nuances of voice and expression. We have endeavored to reproduce faithfully the original sense of the text and as much of its style and form as possible, remaining conscious of the fact that translation necessarily involves the composition of a new text in a new tongue which has to stand on its own. In the translation of certain key terms, we have striven for consistency and in general have followed the usage of the English philokalia. Thus we have, for example, consistently translated the Greek word nous as intellect. Readers unfamiliar with such terms or those wishing to learn more about them are encouraged to consult the glossary, which appears at the end of each volume of the English philokalia. Old Testament references are based on the Septuagint, which for some biblical books, the Psalms in particular, follows a slightly different numbering than the more familiar Hebrew version. Here, too, the interested reader will find an explanation of these differences in the introductory notes to the English Philokalia. Texts and Translations Publication of Elder Emilianos's work began in 1995 with a five-volume series called quote, Spiritual Instructions and Discourses, published by the Convent of the Annunciation in Ormelia, from 1995 to 2006. Of these, an English translation of the first volume, The Authentic Seal, appeared in 1999. The present volume, The Way of the Spirit, is a translation of the second volume in this series, the Greek original of which first appeared in 1998. All five volumes are now available in a French translation published by Ormelia between 1998 and 2006. There are also translations in various states of completion in Romanian, volumes 1 and 2, in the years 1999 to 2000. Serbian, all five volumes, from 2003 to 2006, and Russian, a 2002 anthology, and volumes 1 and 2 in 2006. Two anthologies of the Elder's teachings, each containing eight talks selected from across the five volumes, and published in a small paperback format, appears in Greek in 2004 and 2005. Of these, the first is available in English as The Church at Prayer, The Mystical Liturgy of the Heart, by Indictos Athens 2005. Recently, a new series has been launched, of which two substantial volumes have thus far appeared in Greek. One, the commentary on the ascetical homilies of I Abba Isaiah, Indictos, Athens, 2005, with an introduction by Father Placide de Sille, the abbot of St. Anthony the Great Monastery in France, a dependency of Simeon Petra, and two, commentary on St. Hezekios on watchfulness, Indictos, Athens, 2007, with an introduction by Metropolitan Callistos Ware, a Romanian translation of the commentary on Abba Isaiah, appeared in 2006. Chapter 1. The Progression of the Soul. Footnote, delivered on 27th and 28th of May 1973 in Athens, to the sisters and young women who were later to form the monastic community of the Annunciation at Ormelia. First Assembly. Our subject today is the progression of the soul not from the moment when it decides to live a Christian life, but rather when it begins to confront the problem of spiritual progress itself. Our concern is thus with the life of the soul, with the manner in which it lives. This is a very broad subject, and no one can claim to analyze it fully. Why? 
because matters concerning the spiritual life do not have their foundations in human logic. That is not where they begin. That is why, generally speaking, any discussion that attempts to analyze a spiritual topic solely from the point of view of human logic will inevitably break down. Strictly speaking, then, our subject is neither theological nor academic. Instead, it is purely practical, and we encounter it in the course of our everyday experience. For example, if you walk from here to the center of the town, you know that you'll pass by this or that place, and that you'll need to do precisely this or that in order to get there. You have acquired this knowledge as the direct result of actual practical living, and not by means of any theory. This is why in what follows, some of the things we shall say may seem a little different to you, relatively speaking. When does a soul begin to think about its spiritual life? When does it begin to contemplate a new course of action, to depart from its former habits and routines? This is itself the starting point. But be careful here in terms of what we're saying about the soul thinking. This is a word borrowed from our everyday experience, but the soul does not, in fact, think about its progress. It simply lives something. So when we say that the soul thinks about starting or doing something, what we mean is that it feels the tremor of an inclination to depart from the place in which it finds itself and to move somewhere else, to live differently, in a different manner. You see, the terms we use are all very simple and straightforward. For example, when we use the language of seeing or thinking, or when we describe the soul as knowing and deciding, we're simply using expressions derived either from the world around us or from our inner psychological world. Such expressions, however, do not correspond fully to our true existence. They do not adequately describe our spiritual concepts. Why is it then that a soul says, I must live a Christian life. I must live differently. When it acquires the sense that it is a soul in exile, when it realizes that it is something that has been cast away and now exists outside of its proper place, outside of paradise, in a foreign land, beyond the borders within which it was made to dwell, that's what exile means. And when the soul becomes conscious of this, and remembers its place of origin, then it can say, I must return to my home. It follows then that when the soul realizes it doesn't have God, when it feels itself to be in a state of exile without a home, without a father, estranged from its creator, then it has become like an object long since discarded and having no real contact with God. Then it can say in its exile, I feed with swine and eat husks. I shall go back to my father. Luke 15, 16 to 18. This is when the soul begins to make progress, when it feels what scripture calls the dividing wall of hostility. See Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. The barrier that has risen up between us and God and which separates us from him. But if we don't feel such a wall between us and God, if we don't feel that we are exiles, then we haven't even begun to think about the spiritual life. Footnote 1. See also Archimandrite Emiliano's Catechism on Prayer. Page 199. Quote, God is in heaven and I am down here on earth. So when I pray, I feel at once this insurmountable obstacle blocking me off from God, namely the fact that I am carnal, that I am flesh, in the gospel sense of flesh, whereas God is spirit. Compare St. Isaiah the Solitary on guarding of the intellect, chapter 13, quote, all these things that is sensual pleasure, resentment, hatred, etc., are a wall, Ephesians 2.14, imprisoning our wretched soul. They obstruct its ascent and prevent it from meeting God. From Philokalia, volume 1. St. John Climacus, Ladder of Divine Ascent, 29, quote, Let us break through this dividing wall, which we have erected to our own harm by disobedience. 
and St. Maximus the Confessor from 4th century of various texts. 63, quote, by dividing wall, Scripture means the natural law of the body, and by barrier, that attachment to the passions according to the law of the flesh, which constitutes sin. And St. Peter of Damascus on the two kinds of faith, quote, even if I want to return whence I fell, I cannot do so, since my own will has become a dividing wall between myself and God. End of quote. To continue. The spiritual life, you see, begins with a kind of vision, with the feeling or perception of banishment. And this is not arrived at by means of any intellectual analysis or evaluation. I simply feel within myself the presence of a wall, a barrier, and I don't know what's beyond it. Thus, when the soul realizes the distance between itself and God, a distance so great that no matter how loudly it cries out, it will never be heard by God. Then it will understand how utterly devastating it is not to be able to talk to God. At that point, it will seek to approach him, to bring him close to itself and itself close to him. When the soul feels this condition of rejection and exile, that it's been cast off and thrown aside, and this includes a soul that men may praise or flatter, and even one with a degree of purity, chastity, spiritual qualities, lofty aspirations, and inclinations for the divine. When such a soul, I say, finally understands that it's been discarded, that it needs to find its place in history and in the common body of the church, then it can say, quote, I'll go and seek my true home. It follows then that the spiritual life begins with the feeling of exile, of banishment, of an obstacle in our path, and with the desire to cease being an object that has been discarded and cast aside. And such a desire is perfectly natural. When you see something that's fallen or that's been dropped, it's natural to want to pick it up and put it back in its place. But if the soul doesn't have this feeling, it can't even begin to embark upon a spiritual life. It may live a Christian life, but only in a manner of speaking, only in appearance, only on an intellectual level, only within the limits of its own conceptions. But to the extent that this strong feeling is absent from our soul, we haven't even begun to make a beginning. To use the language of the liturgy, we haven't yet made the words, blessed is our God, a real part of our life. We're still too far away to reach the beginning of the midnight service, never mind matins, and from there to proceed to the divine liturgy, which will unite us to God to the extent that this is possible for us. Thus, the first element we need in order to embark on our path is the feeling of exile. Before us now is the shaken soul, the castaway soul, closed in by four walls and unable to see a thing. This same soul, however, is thinking about breaching the barrier, about breaking down the walls within which it has come to live, and to live instead with God. How must it proceed? Here we need to know that contrary to our expectations, there is no must. Such a word does not exist within the Christian life. The idea that something must be or must take place is a product of the intellect. It is something that I arrive at as a logical conclusion, a deduction based on something in the Gospels, or which Christ taught in his parables, or with respect to his ethical teachings to do this or that. But the word must has never moved anyone to do anything. On the contrary, it makes you feel like a slave and discourages you from moving forward. The force of must moves neither God nor the heart. It pertains only to the logic of human deliberation, to the endurance of human determination, which, as we all know, is something that unravels and comes apart very easily. The most fragile thing in the world is the human heart, along with all of its deliberations and determinations. The things about you that I love, I may later come to hate, and the things about you that I now hate may later cause me to fall in love with you. I may condemn you and on the same grounds proclaim that you're the best person in the world. I can exalt you 
to the skies and at the same time wish you were in hell. I may decide to become a saint and at that very moment become a devil. You can see then that the expression must does not exist here. I can't say, what must I do now? On its own and prior to all intellectual deliberations, the soul has to act and move forward on the basis of what a moment ago we called a kind of vision, that is on the basis of its inner perception and feeling for things. Let us enter more deeply into the main image that we have before us. Man is now cast out of paradise. His soul has been exiled. Outside the gates of Eden, he comprehends nothing but his own pain. And thus scripture says, in pain you shall bring forth children. Genesis 3.16 And in pain you shall sow and harvest the fruits of the earth. Whatever you do will be accomplished in pain. When do we begin to feel this pain? From the moment we experience pleasure. Pain has its roots in pleasure. Footnote 3. See Maximus the Confessor, 1st century on various texts, 53. Quote from Philokalia 2, page 175. Since it is the nature of every vice to destroy itself along with the habits which brought it into becoming, man learns through experience that every pleasure is inevitably succeeded by pain. And so he directs his whole effort toward pleasure and does all that he can to avoid pain. By doing this, he hopes to keep the two apart from each other, which is impossible, and to indulge his self-love in ways that increase his pleasure and that are entirely free from pain. Dominated by the passion of self-love, he is, it appears, ignorant of the fact that pleasure can never exist without pain, for pain is intertwined with pleasure, even though this seems to escape the notice of those who suffer it. It escapes their notice because desire for pleasure is the dominating force in self-love, and what dominates is naturally always more conspicuous and obscures one's sense of what may also be present within it. Thus, in pursuing pleasure and trying to escape pain out of self-love, we give birth to untold corrupting passions in ourselves. Fourth century on various texts. To continue. And when did we begin to experience pleasure? When we realized we were naked. Remember what happened to Adam in paradise? He ate of the fruit and became naked. Genesis 3.7 Moreover, we can say that from the moment Adam began to think about tasting the forbidden fruit, he had already fallen and been reduced to nakedness. In this sense, Eve, too, having entered into conversation with the serpent, was likewise already naked, but neither of them could see this until they had both eaten of the tree. But both of them were inwardly already naked, otherwise they would not have eaten of the fruit in the first place. Food and the subsequent sensation of pleasure merely revealed to them what had already become a fact. Now note this very carefully. Because the soul's progress is of the greatest importance, we begin with pain, which is directly related to nakedness. The soul has to realize that it is naked, not simply something discarded, but something naked. It has to realize, in other words, that it is nothing. Who were Adam and Eve? In simple terms, they were people who walked with God, who dwelt with God. They were God's companions, God's fellow travelers, and as such, they were God's themselves. John 10, verse 34, and Psalms 81, 6. And yet in one single moment, they became nothing at all, so utterly wretched that a mere snake was able to deceive them. And in this way, the brute beasts over which Adam and Eve had been given authority, were now able to rise up against them. That is how man became the most cowardly creature in history. Naked man is something tragically diminished in his being. He is nothing and has only the consciousness of his nakedness, only the awareness of his sin, only the knowledge that he is a sinner. And this does not mean that I say things like, I am a sinner or I must go to confession, confession. 
but it is rather an existential situation in which the soul is much more profoundly aware of its sin. As we said a moment ago, Adam and Eve were in a sense already naked, although they were not conscious of their nakedness. It was only when they sinned that they saw that they were naked and subsequently clothed themselves. Like them, the soul must also feel that it is stripped of every virtue, devoid of all holiness, bereft of divinity. It must realize that it is submerged in sin, clothed in nothing but the leaves of its own iniquities. Will the soul then be able to feel this sin? Yes, but not in the same way one feels an object in the physical world. I can't say to you, feel sin. It's not something that can be produced on demand. It's an action, an activity, a response, a step taken by the soul itself. And it is something the soul must do on its own, figure out for itself. Because no power on earth, not even God himself, can make the soul sense its own sinfulness. Any soul can go to confession, read spiritual books, pray much, and shed copious tears. But all of that can take place without the sense of sin that we are describing here. When the soul acquires this feeling of nakedness and says, I am naked, I must clothe myself, then it has the possibility to feel the need for repentance, the need to be properly clothed, but arriving at the place of repentance is another matter entirely. It's one thing to be naked and it's another thing to manufacture clothing. The two things are miles apart. The feeling of spiritual nakedness, which might last for years or only an instant, is the most critical moment in my life because at that point, one of two things will happen. Either I'll get up and get dressed or I'll remain naked. Footnote 4, see Archimandrite Amelia Nos Catechism on Prayer, pages 213 to 214, quote, This is the critical point. Why? Because it is precisely the moment when we accept or refuse to accept ourselves. Because we discover a self so dirty, so dark, so devious, so cunning that it costs us dearly, that it's not in our interest to acknowledge it. And so we hide behind our egotism, behind the knowledge of the self, behind the love of self, which is in every soul." End quote. To continue, in other words, I'll either present myself to God in my nakedness and say, I have sinned, or I'll try to hide from God, like Adam and Eve. And when God says, Adam, where are you? I'll say, hiding because I'm naked. And when I emerge from my hiding place, he'll see my fig leaves. Footnote 5, for a similar interpretation of the fall and the fig leaves, see the second canticle of the great canon of St. Andrew of Crete in the Lenten Triodion, pages 381 to 382. According to St. John Chrysostom, Christ curses precisely the leaves of the fig tree. Matthew 21, verse 19, in counterpoint to their use by fallen human beings. See also St. Simeon the New Theologian, Hymns of Divine Love, 11, quote, I was incapable of bearing the sight of God's glory. I turned away and fled into the darkness of earthly pleasures. I concealed myself and I took shelter in the ideas of this world as if I were penetrating a tomb instead of stone. And I clothed myself with this unwieldy body for shelter to conceal myself, I thought, from the one who is present everywhere. Yes, shivering, incapable of contemplating his glory, I preferred to slip and to remain in the tomb and to live with the dead rather than to be kindled with love and die completely. End of quote. Maloney, 38, to continue. Why do we so often choose to conceal ourselves and cover things up? For the simple reason that it is a terrible thing for us to realize that we are nothing. Do you know what it means to go from thinking that you're special and important, from being respected publicly, from thinking that you've done great things, from being talented, wonderful, good-looking, charming, and I don't know what else besides, to recognize that on the contrary you're naked and of no consequence whatsoever? 
It requires strength to accept that, a lot of strength. And yet we can't even accept the slightest blemish that we might have or any fault, failure, error, or sin that we may have committed without covering it up with a lie and then covering up that lie with a second one and then the second with a third. A person may conceal his or her nakedness by means of an inferiority complex, by acts of aggression, by self-justification, by donning various masks, and by many other means. Let me give you an example. It will be one taken from external experience because I can't tell you anything else. That would be too deep. Your professor asks you a question in class and all the other students make fun of you because you don't know the answer. You get up, you leave school, you go straight home. You stand in front of the mirror, fix yourself up, put on your makeup, even though there's no one there to see you. But there in front of the mirror, all by yourself, with that self, which is everything to you, you can assure yourself that I, who they made fun of, am beautiful. In this way, I seek to regain my balance, to compensate for the weakness exposed by my teacher and my classmates. At such a moment when I'm in front of the mirror, I'm not standing there in my nakedness, in my inability to answer questions, but instead I'm standing on what I believe are my good qualities, such as my beauty, be it genuine, or the artificial effect of makeup. And such beauty, may be physical, emotional, intellectual, or even spiritual, as we are now in the habit of saying, but it makes no difference. Whatever it is, it's a substitute for my nakedness. Such strategies of denial also involve concealment for myself. What does that mean? It means that even though I'm naked, I'll live as though I were not. And thus, I live a double life. Or I may refuse to grow and progress, as though I weren't naked at all. And this is something much more terrible, for it is the rejection of reality. And such a rejection can only have tragic consequences for me. Life is full of people like that. They know they're sinners, they know they're naked, and yet they go through life doing the very things which they hate, which disgust them, which they know are beneath them. And they know that they must somehow silence the terrible cry of their conscience, which torments them. See Romans chapter 7, 15 to 20. The soul's other alternative is to accept its situation and say, I'll do something about my nakedness. I will declare my sin. I will confess my sin and my nakedness. See Psalms 31, verse 5 and 37, verse 18. And naked though I be, I will nevertheless present myself to God. I'll tell him, you clothe me. And that takes great strength. To turn to God as if nothing else in the world exists requires tremendous honesty and authenticity. And what are the means by which I will either accept my nakedness or pursue a life of concealment? That which we call the ego, the self. Not the ego in the sense of boasting and selfishness, but rather in the sense of an inner balance, a proper self-knowledge and equilibrium. Here we are reminded of St. Augustine, footnote 6, Bishop of Hippo Reginus in Tunisia, North Africa, from 396 to 430. Among his many works are his confessions, a kind of spiritual autobiography, for his life along with a discussion of his place in the Orthodox Church. See St. Augustine, Bishop of Hippo in Synaxarion, 5, pages 514 to 520. To continue. For many years he suffered and wanted to repent. Why did he suffer so? Because he was in conflict with his ego. During one period of his life, he subjected his ego to philosophy, which barred his way to the path of salvation. Before that, the heresy of Manichaeanism stood in his way, and its system of false knowledge served as a covering for his nakedness. Footnote 7, named for after its founder, the Persian religious leader Mani, Manichaeism was a system of metaphysical and ethical dualism in which eternal principles of good and evil were locked in perpetual conflict. It was refuted by many church fathers, including St. John of Damascus, in his work against the Manichaeans. Uh, 
See also his brief description of Manichaean beliefs in on heresies. St. Augustine discusses his own involvement with an eventual rejection of Manichaeism in books 3 and 5 of his Confessions. To continue, but afterwards he humbled himself and together with his young child was baptized and entered the church. It was then that he discovered his nakedness and clothed himself in the garments of righteousness that God had prepared for him. And afterwards he even became a bishop. This balance, this well-regulated scale, upon which so much depends, is our inner disposition, our inner character, and attitude of will. And this disposition, this internal lever, is the ego. It is that upon which we lean and rely. What does the ego desire? One thing only, either to affirm or deny itself, according to the words of Christ. If anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself. Matthew sixteen twenty four and Mark 8, 34. This, then, is the crucial moment in my life when I'll either deny or accept myself, that is, my fallen lower self. This is the point at which I will either acknowledge my nakedness or cover myself with fig leaves. But I remain naked. Note this carefully. If I present myself naked before God, I embark upon the third stage of the soul's progression. Now we are at the beginning of the journey, the point of departure. The progression that unfolds before us is an ascent, a power conveying us upwards. More precisely, it is a movement of return, a holy tremor of the soul, which the soul generates on its own. Think for a moment about the sharp, spontaneous inner reaction I may have if you say something offensive or hurtful to me. This is similar to what we mean when we speak of a tremor in the soul, namely, a strong, spontaneous inner reaction. The soul, therefore, must enact this moment of conversion. It must return to the place from which it came forth. It must return to the hands of God. Moreover, the soul must return in its poverty. Does this mean that man was poor in paradise? Remember Adam. He was rich. He had the whole universe for his own. But then the serpent said to him, What did God tell you not to eat of the fruit of the tree? But if you want to become God, if you want to rule over the whole world, eat this fruit. Genesis 3, 1-5 In response to the serpent's subtle wisdom, Genesis 3.1, Adam acknowledged his spiritual poverty, and so he ate in order to become rich, to become a god. Our own soul is now in that same position. It has eaten of the fruit. Indeed, it, it has just realized that all along it has been eating of that fruit, and now must return to its former poverty, that is, to what it once thought was its poverty, realizing now that such poverty was in fact its beauty, its glory, its divinity, the very threshold of heaven itself. As we have said, the soul must make this movement of return. Let me put it somewhat differently. It must make a circular movement. What does circular mean in this context? Why do I use this word? A movement from one place to another may be linear and direct. Thus we say that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And this may be true, but it also distances you from your place of origin. Other forms of movement may be broken, haphazard, and cir circuitous. Still other forms are circular, bringing you back to yourself. A movement like that encircles you. The soul's circular movement therefore describes the soul's propensity to unfold and extend outward, as well as its movement of return and reinstatement within itself. It follows then that we possess the power of return in order to retrace our steps back to the place from which we were cast out. This is why such a return is always a movement toward our own self. Of course, no matter what we do, we may never actually escape ourselves. All of our outward movements, our desire for knowledge and power, our alleged virtues and various aspirations, are simply spacious substitutes, so much shabby clothing behind which we seek to conceal our nakedness. 
The perfection of the circle, however, keeps us within the sphere of God and at the same time at home in our own lives. This is why I called it a movement of return, because it brings us back. And it is circular because we abide within our true selves. We remain within our own being. Footnote 8. See St. Gregory Palamasa in defense of those who devoutly practice a life of stillness in Hezekiah. From chapter 5, quote, The intellect, or noose, is not like the eye which sees other visible things, but does not see itself. On the contrary, the intellect functions first by observing things other than itself, so far as this is necessary, and this is what St. Dionysius the Great calls the noose's direct movement. Secondly, it returns to itself and operates within itself, and so beholds itself, and this is called by St. Dionysius the noose's circular movement from On the Divine Names. This is the noose's highest and most befitting activity, and through it, it even transcends itself and is united with God. For the intellect, the noose, writes St. Basil, when not dispersed outwardly, note that it does go out from itself, and so having gone out, it must find a way to return inwards, returns to itself, and through itself ascends to God in a way that is free from delusion. To continue. Now this propensity to return to myself, this circulation of the self, this progression toward the recognition of my nakedness, creates within us another impulse, the desire for flight. In other words, now that I've finally returned to myself, I find that I want to take care of myself, to work on myself. Footnote 9, see St. Gregory of Nyssa on virginity, 18.4, quote, and just as slaves, when they have been freed and have stopped serving their masters, turn their attention to themselves, thus I think the soul, once it has been freed from deception and slavery to the body, comes to an understanding of what is particularly its own and natural functions. To continue. And where do we work best? In the midst of noise and turmoil or in a state of tranquility? In the midst of an unruly crowd or when you're by yourself, clearly in solitude. The soul then, when it has reached this stage and wants to return to itself and to God, has a strong impulse to flee. It experiences a powerful attraction from another pole. The impulse to flee brings us in turn to the question of voluntary exile. What I mean is this, if I want to flee from here, I have to forget about you. I have to become a stranger to you. As a result, the feeling, the attraction, the disposition, the inclination, and the propensity toward flight create within me the desire for exile, because as you know, there can be no flight without exile. Finally, the inclination, the feeling, and the need for exile will lead me into isolation. Not psychological isolation, which is artificial, but real isolation, that of the spirit. When I'm psychologically isolated, I say things like, Nobody loves me, or nobody cares about me, or nobody wants me, and so on. Here we are, for example, all gathered together, and you say to yourself, the elder hasn't looked at me once, but he's looked at all the others. That's psychological isolation. It's a false state of mind, a lie, an illusion, and the soul can't be nourished with illusions, because anything false is a concealment of our real selves, it's a fig leaf. Real isolation is spiritual, me and God alone. You cease to be of any importance to me. I'm not interested in whether you love me or think about me. I'm not even interested in whether you're here with me at all. I'm interested only in myself, not in the way we said at the beginning, but in the real sense, in order to discover my nakedness. Just me before God. Me and you who are my God. Real isolation of this sort is a basic requirement of the spiritual life. I can't become a saint unless I am alone, isolated. But in order to be isolated, I must flee. I must attain the status of a stranger, an exile. Our aim is to know God and remain exclusively with Him. But this is extremely difficult because we've grown accustomed to 
to perceiving things by means of our bodily senses. And now we have to learn to live and feel with our spiritual senses. The shift from the bodily to the spiritual requires nothing less than a conversion because the awakening of our spiritual senses is the fruit of repentance, metanya, a change of direction, which literally means a change of mind or mentality. And in order for me to become a new creation, in order for me to undergo spiritual renewal and experience a complete and total change in my soul, I must experience and feel God as a living reality. When we speak of flight, and mark this well, we are primarily speaking about an inner state of the soul and not necessarily about physical withdrawal to a particular place. Footnote 10. See, for example, St. Basil the Great's letters to St. Gregory the Theologian, quote, There is but one escape, that is, from the cares of the world, separation from the world altogether. But withdrawal from the world does not mean bodily removal from it, but rather the separation of the soul from sympathy with the body and the giving up of city, home, personal possessions, love of friends, property, means of substance, business, social relations, and knowledge derived from human teaching. And it also means the readiness to receive in one's heart the impressions engendered there by divine instruction, end of quote. And from Long Rules 18, quote, perfect renunciation consists in not having an affection for this life, remembering death, and not trusting in ourselves. But a beginning is made by detaching oneself from external goods, from property, vainglory, life in society, useless desires, after the example of the Lord and his disciples. End of quote. See also St. Nikitas Stathatos on the practice of the virtues 72. Quote, I have heard people say that one cannot achieve a persistent state of virtue without retreating far into the desert, but the desert is in fact su superfluous since we can enter the kingdom simply through repentance and the strict keeping of God's commandments. Note that Stathatos spent his entire life as a monk in the heart of Constantinople, the largest urban center of the entire Byzantine world. To return, nevertheless, the tendency to enact a physical flight remains strong because we are embodied creatures and experience the world in a very palpable and physical ways. And it is difficult to feel alone, to experience isolation, when we are in the midst of a busy crowd, surrounded by noise, or otherwise entangled within the world. Thus we feel the impulse to retreat physically into a place of solitude and tranquility. This explains the attraction toward monastic life, which comes spontaneously to the soul when it thinks about God. Of course, most people consider an attraction to solitude to be something dangerous, an indication of an unhealthy state of mind. But it is in fact the opposite that is true. Unhealthy are those who have never contemplated flight from the world, for this means they have never been seriously concerned about their souls. If they were to concern themselves with God for even five minutes, you can be sure that for four of those five minutes, their thoughts would be taken up with the idea of going to a holy monastery. That's the way it is. The soul which takes thought for itself discovers that it loves repose. And it finds such repose in communicating with him whom it seeks, whom it wants to discover, that is, with God. In the end, the soul may reject the idea of physical flight, but to the extent that it continues to live a life oriented toward God's kingdom, it cannot avoid engaging in an interiorized existential flight from the world. Is it possible, then, for someone to live his life in the form of an existential flight? Can I, living in the world, live the kind of exilic life that we're talking about here? Of course, I can. But even though such a thing is possible, it is fraught with the greatest difficulties. In any case, solitude and isolation are not, strictly speaking, undertaken for the benefit of God. It's of no importance to God, whether I'm in a monastery or whether I'm in the world. What is important is to know the best way for me to hasten toward God. What is essential is that I exist in a state of voluntary exile, physical or otherwise, 
so that I am a stranger to the world and thus to a certain extent able to sense the presence of God. With the necessity for separation, with this initial feeling of estrangement, this initial exile and isolation from others, comes yet another feeling, the realization that such conditions are not enough for me. I need God. I still don't have him, and thus I am brought to the point where I need to seek him. Do you remember the previous stage, the feeling of nakedness that leads to repentance? At that stage, I was led to the desire for repentance, although I hadn't yet actually repented. Now, I have simply advanced along the way of the cyclical path, drawing ever closer to myself. And it is that movement which brings me to the point where I need to seek God. But as we've said, this is not the search itself. This is not the seeking, because the need to seek is one thing, and the seeking is something else. The soul now confronts a question, how can I seek God? And this, you see, constitutes the soul's combat. It's titanic struggle to regain entry into paradise. I desire God. I proceed toward him. I overcome the great difficulty of deciding between clothing myself with fig leaves or saying, my God, I'm naked. I've sinned against you. I want you. I've passed that stage. Now I'm moving forward. Now I have conceived and bear within myself the idea of searching for God. How should I proceed? The first thing we need to realize is that now there are two of us, me and God. Even so, God and I are still far apart. I have sinned. I have been separated from God, and now I am seeking him. And he too is seeking me because he loves me. Thus we have two movements of God toward me, and me toward God. What can I do for God? Nothing. In fact, I can't even seek him. I can't even repent. But what I can do is to struggle. This means that I can commit myself to a life of asceticism, to the practice of spiritual exercises. And I will undertake such a commitment in a manner appropriate to my way of life that is depending on my situation character, physical strength, psychological disposition, my history, my heredity, in terms of my gifts, and so on. Whatever role these factors play, there will be a commitment to asceticism. Earlier we said that pain begins with the experience of pleasure. Of course, we wanted only the pleasure, not the pain. But now I must embrace pain in order to regain true pleasure. Why? because we were created for pleasure. God created Adam and Eve and placed them in the garden of delights, for this is what the word Eden means in Genesis 2, verse 15. In seeking pleasure, they were seeking what God had instructed them to seek and experience. However, they sought wrongly, and instead of pleasure, they found themselves caught in the grip of pain. After that, they were given disfigured forms of the pleasures they had once enjoyed, disfigured because they were no longer divine but fleshly realities, like those, for example, given to them in marriage. Beginning, therefore, from the pain into which I have fallen, my aim is to find what I was seeking, to arrive at the place of true pleasure, to regain the enjoyment of the delights of paradise. This means that I will make my own the very pain into which I unwittingly fell. And I will do this precisely because this is what I am capable of doing. I have neither God nor the strength for anything else. I am something that is broken. All I can do is feel pain. Thus, I will take upon myself a life of asceticism, of spiritual struggle and exercise. To what we have said about the nature of asceticism, let us now add this. Asceticism is a way in which I, a human being, set about attraction, attracting the attention of God. You do the same sort of thing when you want the attention of the abbot. You make noise, knock on the door, and shout, Yeranda, Yeranda! Others will dress differently or do other things to attract attention. We do similar things to attract the attention of God. Does God have need of such activity? I will say only this. It is something I can do, and God wants me to do what I can. In a manner of speaking, then, asceticism is like putting on my best clothes. 
It's my preparation in order to seek, want, actively desire, love, and finally receive God. And even so, he and I are still separated by a great distance. What we're attending to now are the preparations, just as we would sweep the house in preparation for a visit by our spiritual father. Thus I give expression to my inner disposition by enduring the coldness and filth that is within me, by accepting my nakedness and acknowledging it before God. In doing this I express my desire for God. Asceticism is the way I cry out to him. Footnote 12, see St. Gregory Palamas, homily 12.2 on the fourth Sunday of Lent. Quote, As we learn from Moses, the Lord told Cain that the voice of the blood of Abel cried out to him. Genesis chapter 4, verses 8 to 10. In the same way, all the parts and members of our body, suffering hardship because of fasting, cry out unto the Lord, joining their voice to the prayer of the faster and praying together with him. To continue, of course, operative in all of these stages of the spiritual life is the presence of divine grace. What is divine grace? It is the activity of God. Divine grace is not the essence of God. I remind you once again that we're not speaking in the formal language of dogmatics or academic theology. All we're doing is charting the contours of the soul's progression. We're narrating the story of our soul, outlining the stages of our spiritual struggle at its most practical level. At this point, however, it will be useful to speak with the greater degree of theological precision. Divine grace is not God's essence, but God is imparticipal in his essence. That means that in terms of his inner being, God is utterly transcendent and inaccessible to us. God is absolutely nothing that I could ever imagine, conceive of, desire, nor comprehend. Whatever I can grasp and say, this is my God, will not be my God, because God is not an object that can be grasped. Footnote 13, according to St. Gregory of Nyssa in the life of Moses, quote, he who thinks that God is something that can be known does not have life, because he has turned from true being to what he considers by sense perception to have being. To continue, instead I must feel God. Here's an example of what I mean from the Gospel of John. Do you remember the passage concerning Thomas? Eight days later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was among them. The doors were closed, but Jesus came in and stood amongst them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he spoke to Thomas, give me your hand and place it in my side. Thomas replied, my Lord and my God. John 20, 27, 28. Now, it was Thomas's soul and not his hand which felt the truth of the words he spoke. It was his soul that received proof of the presence of God based on experience. And what was it that he saw? The divine energy. The doors, it says, were closed. How then did the body of Jesus enter into the room? Through the keyhole? No, not through any hole in the door or any other opening. For the body in question was not material, even though it was still a body. It wasn't anything that I can understand or see or conceive of. Whatever I may imagine won't be the body that Christ had at that time. Even so, it was a body. It follows then that divine grace, which is forever rushing toward me, is not the divine essence. It isn't God as he exists in his own being and nature, but it is nonetheless God. It is God's energy. It's God's activity. What I experience is God's rushing and running toward me coming forth to meet me. And even though this running is divine grace and a union with God, it is not the final union. It is a preliminary union. What do we mean by this? I have given something to God that is of absolutely no significance to him, namely my asceticism, my pain. Why? Because I have nothing else to give him. In response, God gives me what I am capable of receiving, what I'm able to contain within myself. In this case, he gives me an initial gift of illumination. And this illumination is participation in divine grace and thus a sharing in the life of God himself. 
However, it's not yet union with God, but rather communion, because now we are communicating with him. It's an illumination. Here's an example of what I mean. We've been living side by side for six months, and all of a sudden I say, Ah, now I understand. Now I realize that I love her. How does something like that happen? It's a flash of light, an internal illumination, a sudden opening of my heart and mind. A thousand different things. But until the moment when I say, Ah, there's a sense in which God doesn't yet exist for me. Union with him has not yet occurred. God has been lost, but now I'm beginning to communicate with him. To use another example, we can also say that it's like playing hide and seek. God runs after me, and I run after him. And if in this game that we play, we're not able to see God, it's not because God is absent, but because I am blind and cannot see him. I have then this flash of light, this illumination, which is an illumination of knowledge. What does knowledge mean here? It has to do not with ordinary reason, but rather with our highest spiritual faculty. It's something more like spiritual understanding, except it's not exactly understanding either. It's a form of recognition, like when I sense the presence of my spiritual father, when I have the feeling that he's coming. It's my Yerunda, I say, and I run out to meet him. I knew it was him. I recognized the sound of his footsteps. I can hear him even now coming up the stairs. Thus, we're talking about a kind of knowledge or understanding that is actually a form of recognition. And that recognition, moreover, is already a movement, a drawing near on my part. When I realize my elder is outside, ringing the bell and walking up the stairs, there's a sense in which I've already turned toward him, already approached him, already touched him. Before I see him, I'm already embracing him, speaking to him, opening my heart to him. This is how I run to him, how my soul makes haste to be with him. It is the activity of my soul. It is not my soul itself, but the activity of my soul. We have then the experience of illumination, which is communion with Christ. It follows that communion is progress toward God. We begin to unite with him, reaching out our hands to him, as it were, and intertwining our fingers with his. Recognition occurs, and even if I'm blind, I'll immediately recognize you by the touch of your hand. At the beginning of this new stage, what do I re recognize? Two things, which I will understand better in time, but which I begin to recognize now. The glory of God and his holiness in contrast to my own nakedness and sinfulness. I am naked. He is clothed. God is clothed in holiness. I am nobody, a nothingness. But from this nothingness, I discover an immediate point of contact. From this is the vantage point from which I can now come to know the glory of God. Thus we have before us the holiness and the knowledge of God. What does the holiness of God mean? It signifies God's transcendence, which is the source of his eminence and thus of his presence to all. What does holy mean? It designates something set apart that belongs to God. In this way, the holiness of God refers to whatever belongs to God himself. It designates that which is beyond everything else. It is something that admits of nothing else, something utterly pure, unalloyed, and immaculate. Holiness is a characteristic of the essence of God. God is holy, and the energy of God is holiness, a radiance coming forth from the divine essence. It follows then that the glory of God is God's energy. It is God himself. I myself do not know and cannot see the holiness of God. However, I acquire a sense of it in contrast to my own nakedness and by means of its manifestation within God's activities. For example, God is not susceptible to sin, therefore God is holy. Moreover, the glory of God is a radiance, a reflection of his essence. It is not something made or created by God, but it is nonetheless real, for it is the presence of God himself. Thus, when we sense the holiness of God and his glory, what we are experiencing is real and truly exists.
Moreover, God's holiness and glory are absolutely essential in order for us to celebrate the liturgy. Whether we are clergy or laymen, we all assemble within the same church in order to celebrate one and the same liturgy. However, if we do not have the feeling of God's holiness and glory, if I don't know how to see God's glory in form, then I am not able to celebrate with conscious awareness. In such cases, I become a passive object. And this is why throughout the liturgy we are constantly brought before the holiness and glory of God. From the prayer of the thrice holy hymn, For you, our God, are holy, and you rest in your saints, and to you we ascribe glory and the thrice holy hymn. The same language is repeated during the chanting of the Triubic hymn. Quote, God, who is enthroned amidst the cherubim and seraphim, the King of Israel, the only Holy One, resting in the saints, I entreat you, who alone are good. This is how I understand His holiness. This is how I draw water from the fountain of life, even though it appears to be so far away from me. Seeing and feeling the holiness and glory of God, I begin to understand the nature of my own nakedness and nothingness. I understand that I am a sinner, that I am nobody, nothing, mere dust and ashes. Genesis eighteen twenty seven. Thus I fall down at the feet of Christ, and that falling down will be the expression and confession of my nothingness. It is the vision of the glory of God, in other words, which enables me to see myself, to recognize my true self, and to gain practical, experiential knowledge of myself. For example, let's say that I've offended one of you, but you remain calm, and when I see your graciousness and how readily you overlook my bad behavior, and how quick you are to forgive me, then I say, what a rude and insensitive man that I am. When I see that you've forgiven my debt of 10,000 talents, Matthew 18, 24, then I'll say, what sort of person am I who won't even give five denarii to someone else? In the face of God's glory and holiness, I acquire empirical, experiential knowledge of myself. This is what we mean when we spoke of the returning, the cyclical movement around ourselves. It is within us that the kingdom of God will enter, not anywhere else. Luke seventeen twenty one. Whatever may exist anywhere else is another matter entirely. It is not for me. As we've said, this empirical knowledge that I've gained is a palpable vision of myself before God, as the result of which I see what I am. It is a revelation, an examination of my innermost self. It is knowledge of that which is hidden within me. Through this experience, I uncover my passions. I uncover my weaknesses. I uncover the stench and the filth that is hidden within me, which I didn't even know existed. It is the consciousness, you might say, of my subconscious, which has now been revealed to me. It is the perception of my corruption and my weakness, the one through the holiness, the other through the glory of God. Now I come face to face with my innermost self. I discover my subconscious and recognize that I am a corrupt man, a putrid being, something utterly ruined and dissolute. At the same time, this recognition of my inner condition is the awakening of my free will. It also marks a difficult turning point in my life, because my sense of and interaction with myself is now much more tangible and concrete. And this is why, as we stated earlier, we have the problem of whether I'm going to accept what I've discovered or whether I'll run away and hide. Now, we're exactly on the razor's edge, and if we fall, our fall will be very great. It's the moment of truth. Will I repent, or will I not repent? It's the beginning of our life. It is here where I throw the dice. This is the most critical turning point in my life. If I reject the opportunity for spiritual growth that God has placed before me, I shall do so in an attempt to deny the truth of my inner corruption, to turn a blind eye to all the filth that I've discovered within myself, and to seek to support and justify myself apart from God. However, that will disrupt my personal drama and recast me into the tragic role of a man pitted against his own self, 
who is in denial of his own self. If, for example, I am pitted against you, our relations will always be difficult and indeed intolerable. I've never had any peace, and will either have to separate or learn how to love each other. However, I can't simply ignore the situation. Imagine now what happens when I am pitted against myself. It means that I am torn in two, that my kingdom has been divided, Matthew twelve twenty five, and that myself is at war with myself. The crucial moment has arrived. From this moment forward, my central ruling passion begins to emerge, a passion that will lead me to a kind of gallows. What that gallows is, is another question. But if we accept ourselves, we will not try to hide or cover up the truth about who we are. Instead, we will desire to make continued progress and receive divine grace. And as we said earlier, to arrive at this point is itself the fruit of divine grace, which is now joined to our free will. Previously, we had the work of asceticism, which we described as an offering of what we were able to give to God at that particular time. I attract divine grace and divine grace descends. The time has now come for divine grace to be united with my own will. When this occurs, the union of my will and divine grace is expressed by a feeling of inner pain. Here we must be clear. This is not the pain of asceticism that we mentioned earlier. That is something else. That was my own pain. This pain, on the other hand, is an ache for divine grace, for God. It is what the psalmist means when he says, My soul has thirsted for the living God. Psalm 41, 2. Longing for God, my soul has melted or is melting. How do you melt from love? No matter what I say to you about melting from love, you won't understand what I mean unless you experience it. The feeling of love, of intense love, which makes you deny yourself and become a mere nothing in the arms of the other. And now it is God's love that is inviting you to entrust yourself completely to him, to surrender yourself, body and soul, so that it no longer belongs to you, but to him. That's the pain of love, a languor, a melting that I feel, although without any trace of sorrow, without the feeling of what we call a heavy heart. Now, pay careful attention here. A heavy heart and a feeling of sorrow, internal sorrow, not external sorrow, are expressions of rejection. They are expressions of the den denial of what I've discovered about myself. Where there's a heavy heart, you will also find the attitude that says something like, no, God, no, stay where you are. Don't come any closer. Where there's sorrow, a heavy heart, and another element, spiritual isolation, there you'll also find denial. That's where a new wall is being built, one that likely to separate me decisively from God. This is why sorrowful and isolated souls cannot delight in God. Will they be saved? As through fire, 1 Corinthians 3.15. We don't know. It depends on different things, but that's another question. In any case, we're not talking about that kind of pain. To repeat, it's absolutely essential that these two elements are not found within us. When we experience spiritual isolation and a heavy heart, it means that we've turned our backs on God. But as long as those two elements are absent, we can experience the melting, which is a thirst, an inner cry. Up until this point, our asceticism has been largely bodily, which was definitely worth something. It was the effort of my body for the sake of my soul, by kneelings, prostrations, things like that. That was the joint effort of my body and soul, the whole person. But this is the cry of my spirit. Second Assembly, 28th May, 1973. As we mentioned yesterday, our theme has a practical side, namely how the soul actually experiences progression in the spiritual life. We considered the various stages through which the soul passes, but in order not to tire you, I will not repeat what I said about that yesterday. Permit me, however, simply to remind you that the soul must first feel that it has been exiled. It must feel the walls that surround it and separate it from God. 
it must experience, in other words, the state of rejection into which it has fallen, followed by the feeling of its own nakedness, the realization of its sinfulness. When the soul has these experiences, it will reach a critical point and have to decide whether it's going to cover itself with fig leaves or uncover itself before God. In other words, whether it's going to hide from God or say, this is what I am, Lord, a naked soul. If the soul accepts its nakedness, its sinfulness, the nothingness in which it lives, then it will also feel an urge toward repentance. This is not, however, the moment of repentance itself, but rather the moment of return, a cyclical movement of the soul around itself, taking proper thought for itself, so that it can return to the natural condition in which God created it. When the soul does this, a desire for escape will be born within it, a yearning for exile, a new state of mind focused on the quest for God. And even though such a soul is still too far away to be able to seek God, it can nonetheless experience two things, that which is proper to itself and that which is proper to God. The first of these, that which is proper to the soul itself, is asceticism, which is a preparation for receiving God. Asceticism is the means by which the soul will cry out and attract the grace of God. The second experience is God's grace, which presents itself to the soul as an illumination, a participation in the uncreated divine energy, and thus a real communication with God. Here we saw the first signs of communication experienced through contact with God. In recognizing God, the soul begins also to recognize itself, to acquire actual experiential knowledge and understanding of its innermost self. We experience, as we said, a, a bringing to the surface of the subconscious. The soul begins to recognize and understand what it has within itself, and thus we come to the second difficult turning point, the fearful moment when the soul will either fall or be raised up. To fall means to try and cover up the subconscious or to reject it and search for substitutes to create the illusion of standing upright in order not to see ourselves as something falling. If the soul negotiates this difficult turn successfully, then it will begin to travel on the road toward God. It will seek to cleanse its subconscious, to purify the depths of the heart. And this will express itself as pain, as a crying out, as a tear shed to God. The soul will again become aware of the need to seek God. However, the search for God has not yet begun. All of this is but the preparation for it. The search itself is still a long way off. Nevertheless, the soul can now experience repentance, which, as we said, is not simply the opening of the gate of the soul, which in, in any case already took place when divine grace opened up the subconscious, manifesting that which is, was hidden, but rather the opening of the gate of heaven. Heaven opens and God descends. This is what we were describing earlier when we spoke about breaking down the hardness of the heart, what the Apostle Paul calls a circumcision of the heart, a removal of its fleshly covering. See Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, and Romans chapter 2, verse 28. And once that covering is stripped away, the soul is laid bare. God is now able to enlighten it, and thus we receive the first essential gift of God, freedom. What is freedom? Release from desires, liberation from passionate impulses, and from every deception. It is, in other words, our emancipation from the unconscious, which to a certain extent has now been enlightened by divine grace. And now that we've been set free, we're able to fly. A slave can't fly, only a free person can. And now that I'm free, the path has opened up before me, and I can ascend the steps of God's love. As I've said, we're merely casting glances at different aspects of our progression without going into all the details. For example, we're not considering how the love of Christ is acquired. Let us assume, though, that we have acquired such love and consider for a moment its relation to the soul's progress. The love of Christ enables us to know Christ. Until now, we've had no knowledge of God's love based on experience. All we had was a theoretical, intellectual knowledge which is a human thing, very small and cheap, limited on all sides. 
whereas the important thing is what I experience within myself and make my own. Experiential knowledge, love, is different from theoretical knowledge in at least one way that you can readily understand. It is one thing to know someone who is a stranger and another thing to know someone who is your spouse. The two have nothing in common. Similarly, it's one thing for me to know what you're carrying in the street and which appears to me to be a black bag, perhaps bearing a brand name or the name of a particular shop. And it's another thing for it to be my own, in which case I recognize it as one of my possessions, as belonging to me. That is the difference between theoretical knowledge and knowledge that comes from the love of God. Knowledge of God is something I acquire through possession, through ownership. It is something that belongs to me. It is a knowledge based on communion of the heart and noose. At such moments, the noose is submerged within God and contemplates God from within. That is the heart's communion with God. This knowledge, moreover, is a theology, because together my heart and noose or intellect think about God from within. This is, as a result, a kind of perichoresis. Footnote 16, variously translated as reciprocity, co-inherence, or interpenetration. Perichoresis denotes either the interchange of human and divine attributes in the person of Jesus Christ, or the relationship of mutual love among the three persons of the Holy Trinity, in both cases comprising a union without confusion or division, on which see St. John of Damascus. On the Orthodox faith, quote, the abiding and resting of the persons in one another is not in such a manner that they coalesce or become confused, but rather so that they adhere to one another, for they are without interval between them and inseparable, and their mutual indwelling is without confusion. And the two natures of the Lord are mutually eminent. See also St. Maximus the Confessor, 4th century on various texts, 19, quote, Revelation is the inexpressible interpenetration of the believer with the object of belief, and entails participation in supernatural divine realities, and as far as possible identity with respect to energy, between the participant and that in which he participates. This identity with respect to energy constitutes the deification of the saints. End of quote. Philokalia, volume 2, pages 239 and following. To continue. My intellect, or noose, and my heart begin to delve into what is, in a manner of speaking, the inaccessible sanctuary of God, to enter deeply into his darkness, because for us, God is darkness, something unknown. See Exodus twenty twenty one. And a footnote 17 on the experience of union with God as entry into a state of darkness. Compare St. Gregory of Nyssa on the life of Moses, St. Dionysius the Areopagite on mystical theology, and his letters, St. Maximus the Confessor, first century on theology, St. Nikitas the Thatos on the inner nature of things, from Philokalia, Volume 4, and St. Gregory of Sinai on the Commandments and Doctrines, Philokalia, Volume 4, and St. Gregory Palamas's Triads. In general, the Church Fathers delineate three stages or degrees in the soul's ascent to God, symbolized by Moses' experience of the light, the cloud, and the darkness. One, illumination, which is the time of purification. Two, Entry into the cloud, which signifies contemplation of spiritual realities. And three, entry into the darkness, which represents the mysterious union of created man with the uncreated God. To continue, there is then this perichoresis, and my knowledge now becomes a quest. I begin to search, to hunt. An amorous pursuit now unfolds between me and God in the gardens, at night, during the day. See, Song of Songs 3, 12 to 15, and 1. To continue, and why do I pursue God? Because God pursues me. That, however, is another matter that does not immediately concern us. If we tried to deal with both at the same time, we would run the risk of failing to understand either. 
But let us not forget that the spiritual life is something that's unified. If you analyze it, breaking it down into its various parts, you'll destroy it. If I dissect you in order to understand the workings of your body, I'll already have made a mess of you. You'll be dead. And in a certain way now, we're dis dissecting and destroying the spiritual life. The spiritual life is an experience, nothing more. It is participation in the Holy Spirit. The moment we place it under a microscope, we reduce it to unintelligible fragments. Imagine if I were to put you under a magnifying glass to see what you were made of, how different you would seem. Gone would be your beauty, gone your value. Everything would be gone. I'd be looking at cells, blood, nerve fibers, something entirely different. You wouldn't be what I now see before me with my own eyes. Thus, rather than illumine the progression of the soul in its fullness, we're actually destroying it and dividing it into parts. Let us therefore ask God's pardon for what we're doing in the hope that we'll understand something from what's been said because the spiritual life can only be understood by means of spiritual perception. When I'm pursuing God in the way we mentioned just a moment ago, when I am acquiring knowledge of Him, communion with Him, when I'm entering in His inaccessible sanctuary, into His darkness, into His gardens, to use the language of the Song of Songs, what is it that I feel? An intense upsurge of both joy and pain. Pain because I'm searching for Him, and joy because I'm living Him, and thus I am living in an upsurge of enjoyment and pleasure. Do you remember what we said yesterday? Adam's pleasure led to pain, and now pain is all that we have. We begin our life with the experience of pain, which alone is uniquely ours, and proceed to what God gives us, an eruption of pleasure. At this stage, we experience both joy and pain. Together, these make up what we call the pain of the heart. As we said yesterday, this pain is a melting, a thirst. When you're really thirsty, you're crushed, ruined. You become a mere nothing. You feel exhausted. If someone doesn't bring you some water, you're going to collapse. That's what happens to the soul. Without God, the soul is not able to live, which does not mean that it no longer has a reason to live, but that it is dead. And this is why from the moment when the soul comes to know God through its own experience, through what we called perichoresis, it will either live in Christ or die. There's no other alternative. This thirst then, this wasting away, leads the soul to experience a desire for death. Why? Because in this deceitful existence, the soul can only see God as a dim reflection in a mirror. 1 Corinthians thirteen twelve. Where's God? Where's my God? Though we desire it greatly, we cannot see God with our whole being. We cannot grasp Him or join ourselves to Him in body and soul, and thus the soul concludes that it must break. Not only the casing of the heart, as we said before, but the whole outer sheath of the body and emerge from it so that it may be liberated and be alone with God alone. The soul experiences this desire for death like a fully formed embryo experiences the desire for birth. It wants to come forth. It must be born because the nine months have been completed. It cannot remain inside any longer. It must come out no matter what. This is the experience that the soul wants to live, a new birth. The desire for death, which is a desire for spiritual birth, is an experience of liberation from corruption, time, and from space. It is a release from our life of spiritual poverty, misfortune, slavery, and beggary. In this life, we are beggars, and we must beg for all that we have. However, we are summoned to break down the barriers that keep us confined in our poverty. We are called to defeat death and attain the limits of incorruptibility in order to be alone with God, to plunge into the boundless ocean of the love, happiness, and pleasure of God, to ravish God and be ravished by Him. What are the signs that mark this point of the progression? How is it known? How is it experienced? It is a rising above and beyond the limits of the soul. And thus the soul undergoes a movement beyond its proper boundaries, beyond its very life, into a realm of transcendence, to God himself.
It is a projection no longer of the subconscious toward the conscious, but rather of the whole person toward the whole divinity. It is a projection of human nature toward the divine hypostasis. And just as the soul goes beyond its limits in order to encounter God, so too does God bend down toward the soul, abandoning his proper limits in order to give himself to me, to surrender himself to me. Footnote. See St. Dionysius the Areopi Guide on the Divine Names 4.13, quote, In a moment of ecstasy, the cause of all, that is God, comes to be outside itself, by its providences for all beings, and being, as it were, seduced by goodness and affection and love, is led down from, from being above all, and transcending all, is brought down to being in all. To continue, thus we have the personal experience of the kenosis, the self-emptying of the word, Philippians 2.7, and of his birth within us. Do you remember what we said yesterday? Whatever has taken place in the history of salvation, whatever was done by Christ, the Father, and the Holy Spirit, must also take place within me. That's what it means for me to participate in the life of God. For example, to the extent that I have emptied myself, I experience what the Mother of God felt when she said to the angel, Let it be done according unto me according to your word. I experience, in other words, her total self-surrender to that which was beyond her capacity to understand. How shall this be, she asked? How can I give birth since I am a virgin and have not known a man? Was there anything she could understand? The angel replied, The spirit will overshadow you and you will give birth. Did she understand anything? Nothing at all. That is what is meant by, Let it be done to me according to your word, which means, Whatever you say, just as you said it, even though I cannot understand it, let it happen just as you say. Footnote 19. See our commandrite Emilia Nos' work on Catechism on Prayer, page 225, quote, My nature and the energy of his nature are united in one person, not in the person of the word, but in the person of someone at prayer. And so that what which happened in Christ through the virginity of the Mother of God, now happens in me through my virginal soul, in travail, day and night, and finally giving birth, so that we shall become one person. End quote. And compare this to St. Gregory of Nyssa virginity. 2.2, quote, What took place bodily in the case of the Virgin Mary occurs in every soul spiritually giving birth to Christ. And St. Maximus the Confessor, 1st century, on various texts, 8, quote, The divine Logos, who once for all was born in the flesh, always in his compassion, desires to be born in spirit in those who desire him. And St. Simeon the New Theologian, 1st Ethical Discourse, 10, quote, Just as God, the word of the Father, entered into the virgin's womb, even so do we receive the word in us as a kind of seed, we do not, of course, conceive him bodily, as did the Theotokos, but in a way which is at once spiritual and substantial, and thus the one whom the pure virgin conceived we possess in our hearts, when, that is, our souls are virginal and pure. End of quote. To return to the text. Do you have a sense of the self-emptying, the self-surrender that occurs? In response, God says, be filled with my grace, my energy. Be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. And this now happens to me. The divinity bends down over me. I now have a personal experience of the self-emptying of the divinity, of the divine energy. As a result, the whole of my being receives the radiance, the effluence of divine energy. This is my divinization, my union with God, in consequence of God's bending down to me. How do I experience this? As an ecstasy. What did we say a moment ago? My life becomes transported to God, and to the extent that I am transported, I am also ecstatic. And what sort of experience is this? It is an ecstasy, a standing outside of my nature. 
And this, let it be said at once, is an act of divine power. It does not mean that I've lost my mind. It's not a pathological phenomenon. It's something above and beyond the natural order. Now I experience the act of divine power. Now the hand of God, which is what acts, comes in, and I become a person acted upon by the power of God. And thus my experience of ecstasy is not, as we said, pathological, but rather a visionary state, an event, a reality, an experience. I now have a true vision of God. I am outside myself and I see God. This is a miracle, a divine phenomenon, and because it unfolds in a state of ecstasy, standing outside of my nature, I experience a loss, a reduction of my physical senses, a loss of my willpower and capacity for desire. Footnote 20. In a state of ecstasy, standing outside of oneself, the natural faculties of the soul are suspended, but not the inner perception of the heart or spirit nous. Compare St. Nilos of Ancra, Discourses of Voluntary Poverty, quote, the prayer of the perfect is the rapture of the mind and the total cessation of sensory perception. Inasmuch as they speak to God by the inexpressible sighing of their spirits. See Romans 8, 26 to 27. And this is why the Apostle Paul, when he was caught up in the third heaven, quote, did not know if he was in the body or not, 2 Corinthians 12, 2. The same thing happened to him when he was praying in the temple and entered a state of ecstasy in Acts 22, verses 17 to 18, and heard the divine voice by means of the inner sense of his heart. For the sense of hearing, along with all the other bodily senses, ceases during the experience of ecstasy. St. Dionysius the Areopagite on the divine names, quote, the union of divinized minds with the light beyond all deity occurs in the cessation of all intellectual activity. On mystical theology, quote, renouncing all that the mind can conceive, wrapped entirely in the intangible and the invisible, he, that is Moses, belongs completely to him who is beyond everything. Here, being neither oneself nor someone else, one is supremely united by a completely unknowing inactivity of all knowledge. And St. Gregory Palamas in his triads See also Archimandrite Emilianos' Catechism on Prayer. In the end, the mind in prayer is caught up. You feel it being seized. In the body or outside, we can't understand, and rises entirely toward God. My ravished mind rises towards God until it is finally united with him who ravished it and becomes God ravished in me. End of quote. To continue, my soul is no longer, as it were, an arrow, about to be shot, but one that has already been released from the bow. Remember where we started from. The soul is something that was shot like an arrow into the world. Now, however, that same soul as spirit, the capacity of my spirit and not the power of my soul is like an arrow that has been shot forth, sent flying and transported to where God is. Footnote 21, the soul is an arrow is a theme explored by St. Gregory of Nyssa in his commentary on the Song of Songs. He states that the bride, who is the figure of the soul, is both struck by the arrow of God's love and at the same time becomes herself an arrow propelled toward God. Quote, the bride praises the bowman for his good markmanship because he hits her with his arrow. The bride says, I am wounded with love. Song of Songs 2.5 these words indicate that the bridegroom's arrows have penetrated the depths of her heart. The archer of these arrows is love, 1 John 4, 8, who sends his own chosen arrow, Isaiah 49, 2, the only begotten son, to, whom, to those who are saved, dipping the triple-pointed tip of the arrow in the spirit of life. The tip of the arrow is faith. And by it, God introduces the archer into the heart along with the arrow. As the Lord says, I and the Father are one. We will come and make our home with him. John fourteen twenty three. O beautiful wound and sweet blow by which life penetrates within. The arrow's penetration opens up, as it were, a door, an entrance for love. 
As soon as the bride receives the arrow of love, the imagery shifts from archery to nuptial delight. Earlier we said that the bride was the target. Now she sees herself as the arrow in the bowman's hand. God treats the purified soul as a bride and as an arrow aimed at a good target. To continue. This is a living experience of the knowledge of God. It is ecstasy, a moment, a movement toward God, and it takes place beyond the boundaries of my ordinary self. Does it take place in the body or outside of the body? I don't know. Neither is it clear what I'm doing or what's happening to me. Do people in love understand what they're doing? Never. Only when they recover their senses do they understand. Of course, such a state of ecstasy conforms to the infinity of God. It is limited for us, unlimited for God. Let's go on. How do I experience this? Note that the question is not, how does God do this? Because how can we inquire into the ways of God? It's too difficult. Instead, we're talking about how we feel when our soul is propelled toward God, when seized by God. It loves him and knows him. We said that to know God, we have to love him. And to love God is to know him. And when we know him, we are able to seek him. For example, when you go to a shop or to buy clothing, you already have an idea about what you want to buy. You look around, you see what's available, you feel the fabric, and if it's what you want, you'll say, I want this one, and you'll ask for it. The same thing happens in the spiritual life. When we have our own experiences and have acquired knowledge from them, then we know what we're looking for. Our soul is now like an arrow in the sky. It was released from the bow, sent flying, and is headed toward God. That's how I feel my soul to be. But what about my heart? How does it feel? It feels like something overcome by the presence of the divine, which has surrounded it and occupied it. I have the experience of a heart under occupation. This is not a heart over which I myself have any power. This is not a heart that can petulantly pluck the petals off of a daisy and say, I love you, God, I love you not. This heart belongs fully to God, having been completely taken over by him. Such a heart is saturated with God and has the feeling of being occupied. The intellect, the noose, has the feeling of being ravished by God, caught up to the third heaven, 2 Corinthians 12, 2. The noose is enraptured, caught up, as if it were no longer within the bounds of the body. Now I realize that my true being is not the body, which is dead without the soul, but is centered in the noose. And now this noose, the spirit of mine, is totally ravished. My spiritual substance, my spirit, has the feeling of someone possessed. What does it mean when I say I possess something? That I'm in complete authority over it. I can do with it whatever I wish. I now feel that my spirit is possessed by God. It follows then that I am God's possession. I have no power over myself, but rather I am under the direct sovereignty of God. Footnote 22. See St. Isaac the Syrian homily number 4. Quote, when the mind is exalted above created things, the body also takes leave of every movement and sensation apart from its natural vitality. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. And he heard unspeakable words. Paul did not hear audible sounds nor did he see a vision composed of the corporal images of sense perception. But it was by intuitions of the understanding, being in rapture, while his will had no fellowship with his body. Seneca Homily 34. To continue. Now that I have the sense of being possessed by God, Two things follow, a sense of liberation from the world and a feeling of security. Let us consider each in turn. Being caught up in the reality of God, the reality of the world, ceases to exist for me. I spontaneously renounce all things. Where is the world? Where are the people? Where are my desires, my self-will? These things no longer seem to exist for me. 
If someone grabbed you by the throat and started strangling you, you'd immediately forget everything else. Something of equal intensity is occurring here. Do you see now how our purification, our cleansing from the things of the world takes place? Everything we said up until now, all the stages of the soul's progress have been leading up to this point. But the question is not how one gets there. It's like the arrow. On its own, it will stay where it is. But it has the potential to be drawn across the bow, sent flying and soar into heaven. And that is God's business. It's an operation of the divine. This is why those who desire to be spiritual must unhesitatingly abandon themselves to the power of God. When they do, God will snatch them up and carry them to heaven, transporting them there by his grace. The response of the soul, as we said, is to reject everything that is outside of God. Nothing else exists anymore. The soul has rejected all things, and it has done so freely, without any cost, because it sees all things as alien. And this includes love, not the love of God. For those who love God love all things. Love in Christ is one thing, but the love which the soul now rejects is something else. It's a passion, a weakness. Now, however, none of that exists for me. I've rejected everything. Now we've finally arrived at the alienation that we spoke about earlier. In the second place, I am conscious of a deep sense of security. Heaven is something familiar to me now. God has ravished me. I can taste God. I've rejected everything else. I am secure. I'm in the embrace of God, in the bosom of God. I'm bent down over him, and he's bent down over me. We're like two people in love, united. As a result of this, however, the soul is confronted with an antimony, a contradiction. What happens at this stage? Do I see God? Do I love God? Here now is the antinomy, a certain tension, a sense of distance, the reason why the soul wished to die. But it hasn't died yet. Only after death will the antimony be resolved. And not even then, but even only after our resurrection, when we shall be made perfect as the church, as the body of Christ, when we shall all become one. So I see Christ and I don't see him. I see him because I am in his embrace. I don't see him because I am in ecstasy, because I am still conditioned by boundaries. I haven't yet become pure spirit. I have not yet been perfected. Remember what we said yesterday? What I see now and what I shall see in the next life are as different as an image of the sun from the actual sun, as an image of the sky from the sky itself, as your own photograph of, of you whom I love differs from you yourself when I have you beside me. That's how much the two things differ, and that's why I both see Christ and yet don't see him. And this, as we've said, is characteristic of a state of ecstasy. When you're beside yourself, when you've gone beyond yourself, you don't understand what you're doing. You feel and yet you don't feel. Why? Because your being is in ecstasy. You live and yet you don't live. We live on the one hand because we are united to life itself, to Christ. But on the other hand, we don't live because, as you know, there can be no life without freedom. Life without freedom is inhuman. Anyone who isn't free, especially inside himself, is dead. Whoever is not free is not fully human. To the extent that we are possessed by Christ, to the extent that Christ has conquered us, we are no longer free. We ourselves have already subjected our freedom to slavery. We gave it up. And to the extent that we're not free, we're not really alive. We have surrendered our freedom to God, and he in turn has consecrated it. He has sanctified us. Please pay attention to what we're going to say now. We have given our freedom to God, and what has God done in return? He has consecrated us. What does consecrated mean? It designates something that belongs exclusively to God, and since it belongs to him, he can do what he likes with it. I have, I have no say in the matter. But at the same time, whatever is consecrated to God moves about in God's space without any question or problem concerning its freedom. It follows then that we're totally free, 
since we've become his and are living the life that we have already that we've always desired. We're enjoying what our heart had been longing for when it realized that it had been exiled from its real life. We surrendered our freedom and received consecration. We live and yet we don't live. One kind of life which was really a death has ended and a new life has begun. We experience what the Apostle Paul meant when he said, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Galatians 2.20 Now do you understand the meaning of this? We live and yet we no longer live because Christ lives in us. I have the overwhelming sense that Christ lives in me. And you can see that this is not something abstract or theoretical. You understand that it cannot be explained solely on the basis of rational categories. Have you understood this? I don't know. But I think that you can see the path that we have to follow in order to arrive at the same point as the Apostle Paul when he said, Christ lives in me, which means that Christ is everything. Do you remember what we said earlier about attracting divine grace? Now it is we who are attracted by Christ. We have surrendered ourselves to him. We no longer live for ourselves. We are no longer focused on ourselves, having given up our freedom and our old way of understanding things in order to be identified with God. And now God takes me by the hand and pulls me along wherever he wants to take me. Psalms 72 verse 22. Footnote 23. The image of the soul taken by the hand and being drawn toward God alludes to Christ vigorously grasping the hands of Adam and Eve in the iconography of the Anastasis, the resurrection. See our commandrat Emilio Nos, quote, Behold, I make all things new. In this sermon, the elder discusses Christ's descent into Hades and states that what the soul experienced in Hades, that is, during Christ's descent, we too can also experience. I don't think there is anyone who has not felt God from the time he was a child take him and hold him by the hand. God has truly held us by the hand and taught us how to walk in life. To continue, I'm a prisoner of divine love. What takes place after this? What goes on in this state of living with Christ? The answer is simple. I know only one thing, that I know nothing. Deep down I understand one thing, that I don't understand anything. What are we able to understand? And how are we able to understand being limited, finite, and bereft of direct spiritual perception? And we find ourselves in this situation because we've entered the realm of the spirit prematurely, that is, before death. And for this reason, quote, I know only one thing, that I know nothing. All I understand is that now Christ himself is drawing and attracting me to his love. And all I want is for this not to stop. I want this ravishment to continue, this feeling of total freedom that I experience in God. And again, we come back to this terrible contradiction of ours. We're human beings clothed in flesh. Just when I realize that I know only one thing and desire only one thing, namely, that this situation should never cease, that I should never turn away from it. In that very same moment, I realize that it has already slipped through my fingers. The arrow, in a way, has returned to its point of departure. Love feels both the retreat and the attraction of the presence of God. This is why the soul wants so much to die, because then it will no longer suffer the withdrawal and cessation of these wonderful experiences. And that is why it says, When shall I depart and be with Christ? When at last? Philippians 1.23 Just when we say, My God, let us be like this always, Matthew 17.4 and Mark 9.5, the feeling of God's embrace is lost and the soul realizes that it's in a cell or somewhere in the world and that it's a student at the university or a poor little monk or anyone at all in a condition of loss living in a monastery in the world, at work, in chastity, or in marriage. We're at the point where we've recognized God, but we have not yet arrived at union with Him. Ecstasy in this instance is not a question of being pulled outside of ourselves, but is rather a transfer 
a transposition of our whole being. What then does the Christian feel who has loved Christ, recognized him, and arrived at this point? What is life like for a person who experiences both the intensity of God's presence and his absence? In his everyday life, he experiences undisturbed tranquility, a sense of peace, a sense of love, and a feeling of security. But there is something else. His whole existence has an element of dispassion about it. What do I mean by this? The ordinary person, or as we say, the normal person, who in reality is abnormal, is in fact a fallen person who exists in a state contrary to nature. And because we've learned to regard the unnatural as natural, the state of ecstasy appears irrational, having something absurd about it. Absurd, that is, from a human point of view. See 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 18-21. But those who belong to Christ are full of peace, joy, and have a deep sense of inner security. They enjoy a certain freedom from temptations and negative thoughts. They do not fantasize or indulge in vain and foolish imaginings. We, on the other hand, <clears throat> go to say our prayers, and our mind is full of such thoughts, like arrows darting through our mind. I hope I don't fail my exams tomorrow. There, the thought is entered, <clears throat> along with all that follows in its wake. But the person who has attained to God is no longer a prisoner of his imagination, no longer subject to negative thoughts. He is, in a word, dispassionate. It's all over, finished. You don't have thoughts like that anymore. You no longer have temptations. You no longer indulge in fantasies. You don't even have the possibility to sin because God doesn't sin and you're completely overwhelmed by his grace. John 5, 14, 8, 11. You are dispassionate, free from the passions. At the same time, however, you experience a terrible passion, namely, the passion of Christ, which again seems utterly absurd and irrational because it's so intense. It's something that is not of this world, John eighteen thirty six. Thus we experience our dispassion, our inner peace, and our joy, not without an element of passion, the terrifying passion of Christ. This situation, your passion unfolded, within the passion of Christ, is what conveys you from earth to heaven. While you're here on earth, you live completely in heaven. This passion of ours, as one of the saints says about prayer, rises you up while you're still on earth and places you within the region of heaven <clears throat> in the presence of God who is over all. Footnote 25, see St. Callistos Xantopoulos' chapters on prayer. Contemplation purifies the mind, while prayer presents it naked before God. And St. Theoleptos of Philadelphia, Discourse on the Hidden Work of Prayer, quote, Prayer restores the unity of the soul formerly divided by the passions, enabling it to dwell in God. First it removes from the soul all the disfigurements of sin, after which it inscribes within it the forms of divine beauty, presenting the soul to God. To continue, we now live in the presence of God. He who rules over the universe, there he is. And it is Christ's passion that has placed you there. This then is the daily experience of the man or woman who lives in Christ. To all appearances, they live their lives just like everybody else. They work alongside us. I sit at my desk and go about my work. And they're sitting and working at the desks around me. And while I'm doing so, I'm thinking about the little pleasures in my life. But they aren't even thinking about anything. They are free of such thoughts, experiencing instead the passion of Christ. But nevertheless, they're just the same as I am. They talk to me. Hello, how are you? How's the family? And so on. But at the same time, at that very moment, they have Christ living within them. They live in the same world as we do, breathe the same air, are confronted with the same basic temptations, but they no longer have within themselves the element of sin. Everything like that has been overwhelmed inside them. As we said earlier, they've been taken over by the grace of God. And they live that life in the utmost calm. The passion of Christ has become their daily experience. 
But even so, such passion, passion, such beauty, such a life is nothing for them. It's, it's, it's normal. It's their bread and butter, as one might say. But can you live on nothing but bread and butter? No. And thus they seek greater ecstasies and visions of God. They seek, in other words, what they lost when they said, Lord, let me stay here forever, which was the very moment they fell. We recognize then that our life is marked by these moments, times and periods when we are raised up to God. We have then, how can one express it, these surgings of the soul. It's like when water reaches a hole in the pipe at which point it bursts forth and jets upward. Footnote 26, compare St. Gregory of Nyssa on virginity, chapter 6.2. Quote, let us assume that water pouring from a source is divided into various streams, and is thus of no use for farming because the division makes it weak and sluggish. If anyone, however, could bring these streams together and collect what was previously scattered, he could use the collected water for many practical and helpful purposes. It seems to me that this is also true with the human mind. If it flows in all directions, it scatters itself by running towards what is pleasing to the senses and has no worthwhile force for its journey to the good. But if it was collected unto itself, brought together, it would move with its own natural energy, and nothing would prevent it from surging upwards and fastening itself upon the truth of reality. Just as water in a pipe, when constrained by force, often goes straight up, unable to flow elsewhere, even though its natural movement is downward, so also the human mind, being constrained from all directions by self-control, as by a kind of pipe, will be taken up by the nature of the movement to a desire for what is above, there not being any other place for it to run to. It is never possible for what has been put into eternal motion by the Creator to stop and to use its motion for useless purposes once it has come to know the truth. To continue, in the same way, those who live in God have their surgings, their ecstasies, their, the upward jettings of their soul and intellect soaring aloft toward God. There is thus a basic movement and alteration between earthly life and the surging of the soul into the region of heaven, which enables the soul to acquire familiarity with the divine. Heaven and God himself become familiar to us already in this life. What I mean is something like this. When I came here today, I was a stranger, and they gave me this chair, and I sat down on it. I could hardly have refused because we're still not on close terms. But if I come here 15, 20 times, I'll come in by myself without even bothering to knock. And once I'm inside, I'll do whatever I want as if it were my own home. That's familiarity. Well, through our repeated visits to the region of heaven, we acquire, as we said, divine familiarity. We return, in other words, to the way things were before the fall. In paradise, Adam, Eve, and God spoke with one another like friends. How beautiful! Just think what conversations they had lasting until late in the afternoon, Adam and Eve together with Christ. As the sun was setting or as it was rising, or at other times in the presence of the beasts of the forest and the fish in the river, there were four rivers there teeming with life, and above them the birds of the air, angels, everything. What superb days they must have spent with God! What marvelous walks they had taken together! And that's exactly what the soul can now experience and enjoy. When I come here, what do we do? <clears throat> we exchange the usual formalities. How are you? How are things going? Is that your brother sitting over there? As I said, formalities. But when I gain confidence, my questions will become more direct, more searching. I'll begin to communicate with your heart, and I will come to know the secrets of your home. Now, in very much the same way, I begin to enter into the secrets of God. But these are not the first revelations that we spoke of at the beginning, for those are something else. Since I have been granted familiarity with the divine, God reveals himself to me in my noose. Now I begin <clears throat> to enter into the mysteries of the divinity. Now I begin to understand the doctrines of the Church. The Holy Trinity is no longer something ill-defined and obscure. 
I'm no longer unclear regarding the the self-emptying of Christ. Philippians 2.7 However, this does not mean that I am now capable of explaining to you what the Holy Trinity is. I am not able to do so, nor would you be able to understand me if I could. At this stage in the soul's progression, my understanding of the Holy Trinity is directly revealed to me by God himself. I receive a revelation of the Holy Trinity. I receive a revelation of the mysteries of God, of the depths of God. Whether these are hours or days or fleeting moments, they are moments of revelation, moments of life lived intimately with God. And if you could, you would give the whole world in exchange for such a moment. It would be more than worth it. Shall we continue? I don't think we're able to go any further. Let us conclude. We've seen the progression of the soul from the moment it realizes it's in exile until the moment it tastes the love of God. From that point on, the soul, loving God, prays continuously and remains in Him. We considered our ordinary, everyday moments as well as the moments of ecstasy. Will we ever attain such ecstasy? I can't say. But it's a possibility that is within the reach of each and every one of us. In place of a conclusion, let me share with you two examples of what we've been discussing. Someone, let's say he was a monk, someone dedicated to God, left his monastery. He went off to pray off into the distance. He went out through the fields into the forest, seeking God and crying out to him. The others missed him. They didn't know where he was and they shouted for him. They didn't find him. But he, crying out and shedding torrents of tears, and allowing his soul to reach out to God, entered a cave. There in the darkness of the cave, through interminable nights, he knelt in prayer, and this kneeling was his self-emptying. It was his bending down over God that we were talking about, falling on to God. He prayed continuously, whether in the body or outside the body. He couldn't tell. Forty days went by. The others eventually found him. They shook him and realized that he was entirely fragrant, but he himself did not move. His soul had departed. He was, as we would say, dead. But anyone with spiritual vision would say that he was finally alive. He had ascended to eternal life. In this life he did not find what he was seeking, the vision of God. But now his soul lives with God and gazes upon him endlessly. A second example, there was a monk who was a man of spiritual desires, Daniel 10.11. He left his monastery in order to dwell in a cave where he prayed to God. The sun rose, the sun set. Outside, life went on as usual. Peddlers shouted in the streets. Farmers tilled the fields. Children strove in the schoolyards while the aged grew weary and slept, but he wasn't aware of any of it. He was living in eternity, kneeling there in the darkness of the cave he was praying to God. Forty days later, the others who had been extremely worried found him there. They saw his ecstasy. They saw that his heart had been transported. And that which they beheld, which was so extraordinary, so heavenly, was present here on earth, down here in this world. Is he alive? Maybe he isn't, thought the person who found him and went to touch him. The startled monk shook himself at once. Why did you bring me down, he complained, as if he'd just woken up. Was he sleeping? No. His noose had been united with God. When they touched him, it caused his noose to return, and he realized that he was in a cave and that next to him was a living human being, in reality a dead man, the man who had shaken him, And that's why he said, why, why did you bring me down? For he had been above with God. If we wish I, we can, on the one hand, remain on earth and enjoy such intimacy with God so that even the slightest touch would make us say, why did you bring me down? On the other hand, we may wish to fade away like the monk in the first story who left his body so that his spirit might forever gaze upon God. Wouldn't either be worth all our effort? either the one or the other, leaving our bones here on earth or living here, but being with God. It seems to me that this is the reason why God cast the soul into the storm of life and consigned it 
to the hell of fallen existence when it sinned, so that it may begin to reacquire these experiences. When we feel that we're in exile, when at some point we feel that we're living without God, let us recall these moments. Let us desire a life such as this. Response to a question that was not recorded on the cassette. Divinization is a continuous act, a dynamic activity. It's not something that happens once and for all. Divinization is a dynamic state of potential which is realized and accomplished progressively and which will be completed eschatologically in the next life. Thus, when my life is para, por, porretically joined with God, <clears throat> as we said earlier, when my soul jets upward, then my ordinary everyday moments will participate in, will become experiences of the passion of Christ. And that passion will itself be a search for Christ. But there is something else. These spiritual leapings and revelations mean that I have found God, that I have conquered God, it follows then that in <clears throat> the seeking is the finding. To seek for God is already to have found him. Footnote 27. Compare St. Gregory of Nyssa, homily on Ecclesiastes. There is a time to seek and a time to lose. Ecclesiastics 3.6. What should we be seeking? The Lord, as it is written, Seek ye the Lord and be strengthened. Seek his face continually. Psalm 105.4. And again, seek ye the Lord, and when you find him, call upon him, Isaiah 55, 6. Thus we know that we should be seeking, and that the finding of it is itself a continuous seeking. For the seeking and the finding are not two different things. To continue. <clears throat> this is my everyday experience. The moments of our life are moments of quiet, calm, joy, and of the passion of Christ, during which we have Unceasing prayer, 1 Thessalonians 5.17. My soul has learned how to pray without any prompting on my part, since it has become acquainted with God, thinks about Him, and loves Him. I don't need to say, my soul, pray now. You have to say the Jesus prayer 500 times. No, my soul has learned by itself to pray without ceasing. But be careful here. This is not a question of praying incessantly as the result of force or effort. It is not prayer because we must pray. Remember what we said about must. It's the beginning of failure. But because we can do nothing else. Since it has tasted God, the soul prays spontaneously, and prayer is now an expression, the offspring, initially of love for God and then of communion and union with God. Prayer is what I do because I love God. If you love someone, you want to communicate with that person. And thus I seek to communicate with God because right now I'm here on earth in this ordinary life. Because as we said, prayer ceases when we ascend up there. There I'm taken over, occupied by God. There he reveals himself. He sets us aflame. His rays encircle us. We are saturated with his light and we have become what he is. When a piece of iron is placed in the fire, it will eventually be transformed into fire. That's how I become. There, prayer is ecstasy. But here, where I'm in my right mind, to put it in an impoverished human terms, here I pray because that is how I express my love for God. That is how I express my communication and union with God. It follows then that this love of mine is no longer an activity of the noose, or the intellect, but rather an activity of the whole person. This is why we say that one should pray from the heart, which means that the whole person should pray. The whole person should be elevated to God. That is what prayer is. <clears throat>